I call on the honourable member for Trospec. A little bit of quiet on the government side, I, please. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to direct my question, Mr. Speaker, without notice, to the Minister of Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs. And I draw the Minister's attention to an article in today's Fairfield Liverpool Champion reporting that a firm, Employment Interactive, has won a tender for 12 employment service Look, sites around Sydney. a little more it's impossible to Isn't hear. it the case, Minister, that this is an unincorporated body? It has no infrastructure, no offices and no employees. Can the minister inform the House what financial viability checks were made on the organisation's principal, Mr Kanda Rowood? Can the minister also inform the House what probity checks were made on Mr Rowood, who, as an employee of the Islamic Council of New South Wales, helped write the Council's unsuccessful tender while separately tendering? Is the minister concerned that even low employment this is going very, very close has hung to out, being out of order? Mr Rood has come to an arrangement for the work to be done by another group because he cannot I think you might write him a letter. I ask the honourable member to sit down to resume his seat, rewrite the question and put it in order. The next question, please. The honourable member for Aston. Honourable member for Hotham. Point of order, yes, honourable member for Hotham. Are you ruling that that question is out of order? That question is out of order. Then I dissent from your you ruling, may, Mr Speaker. But you've got to do it in writing and you've got to do it immediately. I Can you do it? I don't hear you until you've written it out and I've received it at the table. Right. Can I have a little bit of quiet, please? I'll call the honourable member Aston directly. Mr. Speaker, this is a situation that you have brought upon yourself today because in circumstances in which the minister has been running around the country touting the great success of his new employment initiatives, heralding the fact that what they've got is more entrance into the field, he's been ignoring the fact that the basis upon which the contracts were being let took no regard for the circumstances of previous operators, no regard to the bona fides of people that were bidding for these contracts, no check on them, and yet he's trying to argue the point argue the point that they've got a much more effective system in place. Mr Speaker, I would a ask you, quiet, I would I'd ask like to you wise, uh, to dissenting from my ruling apart from anybody else, the honourable member Hoffman. I would ask you to go back and look at this question because what it does is it draws attention to an article today in a local newspaper of the member. You are one that has argued consistently that more opportunity should be given for backbenchers to raise issues in this House. And on the first occasion you've got a backbencher up from outside, you have knocked her off. What sort of fairness is that? Well, I think the Honourable Gentleman could use a more happy expression. Fairer though I might be, I suggest you might use a more appropriate form of word. A little bit of quiet, please. You. You. Right, a little bit of quiet, please. The honourable member for Hotham. The other point that was in this question, and these are important facts to establish, so that the minister, who is well known, he's got the nickname Doctora, because every time there's a new statistic goes out, he comes round a with little his bit little of quiet, out, please. Comes out with his white out manipulates the figures and ignores questions put to point him on order. the detail. The Honourable Member Sturt. Point of order. Mr Speaker, understanding Order 100, a dissent in the Speaker's ruling, debate shall be proposed to the House and debate thereon shall proceed forthwith. I would put it to you that the debate should therefore be about the dissent from your ruling, not about the substance of the question. I thank so you I'd for your assistance. To order. I thank you for your assistance, but there's no point of order. The Honourable Member of Hotham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The second, the second point that was raised in her question was that this was an unincorporated body. It had no infrastructure, no officers and no employees. Now, I would have thought that a minister claiming that they had a better system in place should actually be asked to explain how he can award a contract to someone who hasn't got an office, hasn't got infrastructure, hasn't got employees. What sort of service are these people going to be offering, Mr Speaker? The third part of the question is— A little more quiet, please. Can the minister inform the House 
what financial viability checks were made on the organisation's principal, no. um, Mr Carter Rudy. And the reason for that is that there were requirements under the past principles that we administered for such, for such financial viability checks to be made. Indeed, I think if you look at the proceedings of the Auditor General, he in fact requires it. And indeed, if you had have made the viability checks, one would have assumed that, don't you think a little question mark would have raised itself? No office, no infrastructure, no employees. How viable is that, Mr Speaker? I remind you, I are dissenting from my ruling. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm telling you why. Because this question was completely in order. It was completely in order. And you have made the decision to rule it out of order to, well, maybe to protect the minister, not on the question of length. And the reason you didn't do it on length is because the member for Patterson, the question before, went on with just as equally a longer question. I might also point out. I might also point, point out. Point of order, the honourable member for Patterson. I ask him to withdraw that. I find that objectionable. I ask the honourable member of Hotham to withdraw that remark, which the gentleman. But the member for Patterson finds offensive. <laughs> and I would Do you withdraw that remark? With I ask you to withdraw that remark. What remark? The remark to which the Honourable Member for Patterson took oh, offence. A little more. What so remark? It's the normal practice. I'm afraid we're, there is no point of order being taken at this time you other than the one by the Honourable Member for Patterson. And I would ask the this Honourable Member Hotham to withdraw that remark. Well, I don't even know what remark it was. But so it you might now... well withdraw it. Well, then I do withdraw right, whatever thank you. You it was. You but let me just say, can I have a little now, bit of quiet on the government side as well as the opposition? Are you going to require the minister, the leader of government, business of the house, and the prime minister to withdraw their remarks when you ask it of them? Unlike being stared down by your predecessor. There is a, another requirement that, if you wish to make remarks of that sort, you make them by substantive motion. So I ask you to move on to your dissent from my rule. I, I, I continue, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I was making reference to the question previously made by the member for Patterson and draw your attention to the fact that his question related to a matter that had already been determined by this House and understanding orders there should therefore have been no capacity for it to be asked, a ruling that has been made on previous occasions in this House. Now, If you want to get technical with the standing orders and reckon you know them, you should have ruled him out. But what we've got is a circumstance in which he has breached the standing orders with the question that he's asked. He's been allowed to ask it, but as soon as one of our backbenchers gets up, you do not allow it. Is that even-handed, Mr Speaker? That's why I'm moving dissent from your ruling. And I continue on in terms of the detail of this question, because it's very important to get this on this record. And you have made a bad ruling today, and you've got to understand why you've made it. It's inconsistent on the one hand, and her question was not out of order. It was Hello, not out of order. Quiet, please. I'm still interested in what the honourable gentleman is saying. I think the everyone would like to hear it. The next part of the question is: Can the minister also inform the house what probity checks were made on Mr. Ruday, who was an employee of a council? Now understand this, Mr. Speaker. He was an employee of a council that made a bid for an employment contract, the council got knocked off—I'm sorry if that term offends in that circumstance too—the council did not succeed, but Mr Ruday succeeded by putting in a, a submission at the same time, a different submission. Now, again, can I just ask you to understand what we're dealing with here in terms of this man this man who argues as minister that he's put in place this great new system, he allows, an offer, he allows a contract to go to someone without an office, without employees, without infrastructure, but worse, this person is an employee of a body working to get that body up and at the same time writing his own the submission. For customs excise. The Honourable Member for Hotham is proposing dissent from your ruling. He must therefore confine his remarks to the appropriateness of your ruling and not canvass the issues of the question. Thank you very much. I call the Honourable Member Hotham. I think that uh, there's some truth in what he says. At the same time, I think it's also quite valid 
for the honourable member for Hotham to argue the reason that he dissents, and I believe he's endeavouring to do so. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, what we've got here is dissent from the Speaker's ruling. I'm entitled to say why we're dissenting because his ruling that the question was out of order. I'm saying the question was not out of order. And if you don't understand that as his henchman, if you don't understand that as his henchman, he's even he wasn't silly enough to get up and take that point of order. He cheated you up. I Come in, spinner. To the floor. Thank you very much. And then the final part the of the Member question. Honourable Member O'Connor, on a point of order. Clear reflection on the chair to suggest that anybody is the chair's henchman, and I would ask that that matter be withdrawn and an apology issued to yourself. Thank you very much, Honourable Member O'Connor. I call the Honourable Member Hotham. I didn't regard it as a friction on me. Just remind him you don't need his help too often. Never scored I've always his appreciative life. of him, particularly on his wedding anniversary. Oh, yeah. Oh, we all know that. Prime Minister wouldn't reassert his commitment to independence in the House, but he did get up and announce the 40th anniversary of Wilson Tucky. What a sham you are. Oh, there we are. We say, will you reassert your, Can your I commitment to an independence bill? And you say, happy hand. anniversary. Happy anniversary. Right, a little bit of quiet, please. Let's get back to uh, the matter in hand. The Honourable Member Hotham. <laughs> and then the, que then the last part of the question, and bear in mind, Mr Speaker, that you had heard all of those points until the last paragraph that uh, was got to when you, drew her, when you asked her to— uh, I think you made some uh, comment that the question might have been going a bit too long. But, you said, but it then goes on to say, is the minister concerned that even though Employment Interactive has hung out its shingle, Mr Rudy has come to an arrangement for the work to be done by another group? Oh. Oh. Mr Speaker, this is the point of the question, and I would have thought entirely relevant to a parliament that's supposed to hold this mob accountable for the way in which they spend public money, to be able to ask a question in this form. One, one the body got a contract. The, the person got a contract. Secondly, the person who got the contract didn't have any visible means of support. Third, that person was bidding for an organisation at the same time as he was bidding for himself. Fourth, were there probity checks to establish whether this, this, quest, this um, contract should have been written? And then the fifth, and I would have thought the most telling point, the point at which you interrupted, which again went to show that this great contract that was being left, it was incapable of being delivered by the person who received it, because the person then contracted it out to someone else. Now, Mr Speaker, I must say, if you don't think that that is a relevant question, then I'm at a loss to know what you think is. Now, well, it is what he said. The ruling was, the ruling, the ruling was, go and get it in some sort of an order. Well, what's wrong with the order in which it came? I mean, what would you do? What would you do? Do you want to understand the order again, Mr. Speaker? Because clearly that leader of government business over there doesn't know any better. But the sequence of events is this. This is the order of the question. And tell me for the life of me how you would reorder it. The sequence of events is that the thing was reported in the newspaper. Fact one. The second, the and today. The second is that the body that received the contract was an unincorporated body without means. Without infrastructure, without an office, without any employees. The third was, did the minister seek to ascertain that fact? Did he carry out the probity checks? The fourth was, what probity checks were made of the individual, given that he was not only bidding in his own right, but he was bidding in be on behalf of an organisation, an organisation that lost the contract to him? And the fifth point, entirely appropriate, having got the contract, he then can't fulfil it. Now, Mr Speaker, I am at a loss to understand why that is not in the relevant order. And that's the ruling that you've made. You've said, I'm taking the question out, I'm not allowing the question because it's not constructed in the right order. And that's why I'm dissenting from the ruling. Now, Mr Speaker, we have made a commitment in this place with your predecessor 
and indeed with you today. A little more quiet, please, in the body of the. the by a apartment. speech, I might say. By a speech, I might say that was measured by the leader of the opposition, in contrast to those on the other side who sought to welcome you but forgot to do it. I mean, we had the prime minister today reminding you of Jim Cope's dismissal and your court case. I'm sure you were very appreciative of the fact that your pri the Prime Minister drew your attention to that when he thought he was welcoming you to the chair. You had the Leader of Government Business in the House also, also seeking to go on to the uh, Jim Cope there. I think he even forgot to thank you, uh, congratulate you, but don't worry. He's even handed this guy. He didn't even thank Bob Elverson properly yesterday when he fell from the chair. Now, the point we're making is this, Mr. Speaker. We are prepared. We are prepared to cooperate with the chair and try and ensure the orderly running of this house. But we are not going to be mugged. We are not going to allow ourselves. We are not going to allow ourselves to be mugged in terms of putting questions of legitimate importance, particularly backbench questions, particularly questions that relate to the member's electorate, the member for prospect, particularly questions that relate to billions of dollars of taxpayers' money and particularly the questions that are so important in the context of the economic debate at the moment because we believe that the government's employment, program, uh, um, employment policies have failed and we believe the structures they've put in place to try and get people into work have also failed. There's no point then trying to run around the country and say they've created 300 new outlets when they've gutted 1,300 of them. And if, in fact, this is an example of one of the replacement outlets, God help us. I mean, what hope is there going to be for the unemployed in this country? If they're told, oh yes, we've got this great employment agency out in Fairfield, trouble is we can't give you an office address, can't give you a telephone number, can't give you a fax. They haven't even got any employees, by the way, but they're there to help. This is a government initiative. We are there to help. This is the David Kemp solution to problems. We're there to help. Help with no people. Help the unemployed by giving a contract to a body that's got no people to help them get employed. And then this Mr. Rude, Mr. Rude, he wins the contract. No doubt he sees some advantage to him in the way in which the contract's led and his ability to uh, get something for it. What does he do? He goes and hangs his shingle out and, and, and subcontracts his business to someone else. Now, I would have thought, Mr uh, Speaker, that that is a legitimate cause for question in this parliament. It's current to the issue of the day. It's the most vital policy issue facing this country, how we deal with the unemployed, how we ensure that assistance is delivered effectively, how we ensure that in terms of taxpayer assistance they get value for their money. Not some shonky arrangement, not some shonky arrangements where the contract is let to someone who doesn't even have an office, a fax, an infrastructure, employees. I mean, this is the question that we wanted answered. And I must say, Mr. Speaker, what you've done, what you've done is certainly have given us time to reorganise the question. We've had 20 minutes to reorganise the question. Trouble is, we would like an answer. But I must say, having argued this point, I find no difficulty with the way the member for Con uh, Prospect have constructed the question in the first place. And I don't think anyone on our side finds difficulty with it. And I would urge you to reconsider your ruling, urge you to reconsider the ruling and allow this question to be answered. The truth of the matter, Mr Speaker, is this. We are prepared to cooperate so long as we are being afforded the opportunity that we're entitled to in this House. That's the opportunity of making the government accountable, making a government that proclaimed in its policy that it wanted to be more accountable. Remember the time it used to float through and say, we're going to be available here uh, more often than the previous government. We're going to make sure that our ministers answer the questions. I was interested in your comments earlier when you came into the chair about the relevance of questions. We will be interested to see how that ruling is enforced, Mr Speaker, because yesterday we had the Prime Minister ask twice 
as to whether he was going to stick to his 40% target on private health insurance. Today, he I ignored the question both fact. times. Ignored the question both times. Mr Speaker, the reason this dissent has been moved, and of course we're reluctant to do it on your first day, but I believe that the ruling that you have made is incorrect. I believe the ruling, if it's to be an indication of what you're up to in the future, will cause a shambles in this House. If you're not going to allow members on our side of the parliament to legitimately ask questions about their constituencies in the context of policy frameworks that we are arguing against, that we have a legitimate difference of opinion about, if we're not being allowed to ask the questions on the detail, the specificity related to the electorate, then there is no point in you. You may as well shut question time down. You may as well, Mr Speaker, because if that's not accountability in its truest form, what is? This is a question asked of a minister about an area that he's been um, proclaiming policy changes to the benefit of the nation in. This is all his own work. But what we seem to have here is a shonky arrangement. Now, he might be able to explain it, only you've stopped him giving the explanation. And you've stopped it because you think the question was out of order. Now, in the, in the time that I've had available, I've gone through point by point, indicating why it was entirely in order. Mr Speaker, I would ask you to reconsider your ruling, allow the member for Prospect's question to be answered, because, uh, uh, asked, and most of all, we'd like to hear what the doctor is up to in terms of his defence. Because if this is the first one that we've found, if this is the first one that we've found, how many others of the 300 are in this category? The public deserves to know. The parliament certainly should. Your ruling is preventing that happening. Yeah. Is the I second the dissent seconded? The yes, I, the I second the, the motion. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I am uh, the first to concede that from time to time the opposition asks questions which test the standing orders to the limit. I'm the first to concede that. And uh, I'm the first to concede that from time to time we get our readings of standing orders wrong. And I'm the first to concede that from time to time we and government members will get up and ask questions in this place, the purpose of those questions of which is to make a point and the answer to them is largely irrelevant. These things happen in question time and uh, it's uh, part of the robust exchange and speakers enforcing the rules we might, from, might from time to time interrupt that process. But there are occasions in the House when questions are actually asked that refer to the classic purposes of question time, and that is the purpose to hold a government accountable. That is why question time exists. It doesn't actually exist for other purposes. The other purposes have been grafted onto it. And holding governments accountable go to, uh, goes, of course, to the impact of their administration, the consequences of effects of their administration, and, uh, and, of and may from time to time, provided to win the other framework of the standing orders, go to their legislation. It does seem to me that you had an opportunity to rule out of order one question so far asked during the course of question time, and that was the one prior to that asked by uh, the, uh, the honourable member for Prospect. That was the one asked by the honourable member for Patterson. Because if you go to what standing orders say a question must contain, it says this. A question should not contain statements of facts or names of persons unless they are strictly necessary to render the question intelligible and can be authenticated. B. Arguments. C. Inferences. D. Imputations. E. Epithets. F. Ironical expressions. Or G. Hypothetical matter. And there are other elements of it that ask that you, you can't ask for expressions of opinion and uh, you can't ask for announcements of government policy and the rest, uh, and the, and the rest of it. And nor can a question, a question cannot be debated. So if you go through all those particular elements and then go to the honourable member for, for Patterson's question, what you will find throughout it is argument, you will find inference, you will find epithet, ironical expression. You'll find all of those throughout the, that member's questions, and that member's question was challenged in this place, and a ruling sought from you, and your ruling was to uphold it. That was your ruling. And uh, that, so, as the media and others pass judgment on this debate today, a debate which we will lose because of the numbers in this place, I would urge them to look at the question 
asked by the honourable member for uh, uh, honourable member for Paterson, and then look at the question asked by, by the honourable member for Prospect, and ask whether, on this first day of a new speakership, the opposition has been dealt with by with consistently and with comparative fairness. Now I go to the question that was asked, and the first phrase in that is this. I draw the minister's attention to an article in today's Fairfield Liverpool Champion reporting that a firm employment interactive has won a tender for 12 employment service sites around Sydney. Now, is that a statement of fact or names of persons unless they are strictly necessary to render the question intelligible and can be authenticated? Well, they can be authenticated. We can produce the article that appears, and uh, I wouldn't have thought that there was an item in that which was in any way unnecessary. Is there an argument in that sense? No fair person would say there was. Is there an inference? Is there an imputation? Is there an epithet? Is there an ironical expression? Or is there hypothetical matter? And the answer is no. There is nothing of that in any of those parts. So I go to the second phrase. Isn't it the case that this unincorporated body has no infrastructure, no officers and no employees? Statements of facts? No. Uh, unnecessary? No. Arguments in that? No. Inferences? No. Imputations? No. Epithets? No. Ironical expressions? Or hypothetical matter? Now, of course there is none there. Of course there is absolutely nothing of that in that, uh, in that particular point, because the, because the simple fact of the matter is that uh, if you are if you're going to establish a case that there has been in some way or another an inappropriate activity, an abuse of process, uh, asking a question about whether or not there is an unincorporated body that has no infrastructure officers or employees, as the article indicates, that is an important thing to consider. And then the next point is, can the minister inform the House what financial viability checks were made on the organisation's principal, Mr Carter Rude? Is a name mentioned here unnecessary to the context of the question? No. Is there argument there? Could I ask the members of my left to be a little quiet is so we can all hear the Leader of the Opposition? Is there an imputation? Is there an epithet? Because they're not talking is there an ironical lot expression? Or is there hypothetical matter? And the answer is no. There is none of that in any of those cases. A, that's, and that is the third point of asking, as far as that question is concerned. And then there goes, can the minister also inform oh, the House them, what probity checks were made on Mr Rude, who is an employee of the Islamic yeah, Council of New South Wales, helped write the Council's unsuccessful tender while separately tending? Is there in there an unnecessary statement of fact, an argument? an inference, yeah, an that. imputation, an epithet, an ironical that. expression or hypothetical like matter so in any of those items in that particular question. How else can you ask them? If you, believe, if you believe on the basis of information that is presented to you that are actions have taken which may potentially or may be improper in relation to the administration of a person's portfolio, I ask you in all fairness, how could you ask the question in any other way? And then it goes on. Is the minister concerned that even though Employment Interactive has hung out its shingle, Mr Rude has come to an arrangement for the work to be done by another group because he cannot deliver on the tender? So I ask you again, is there any statement of fact in that which is, uh, renders the, the question in some way unintelligible? Is there argument? Is there inference? Is there imputation? Is there epithet? Is there ironical expression or is there hypothetical matter in that that uh, is uh, in some way or another rendering that phrase the final phrase of the question the final phrase of the question an inappropriate question I think in all honesty Mr Speaker you have probably picked on the one question we have taken so far that even the most stringent scrooge like interpretation of the standing orders could not have permitted you to rule it out of order. The one question thus far asked, probably in fact in debate today, the one question asked on either side of the House, the one question asked on either side of the House that probably actually conforms to the most Scrooge-like interpretation of stranding orders. It didn't require a smidgen of generosity on your part, not a smidgen of generosity. The question asked by the member for Patterson, which will be inspected, I am sure now, by the media and others who are interested in this judgment on your first ruling and your first dissent motion on your first day, they will make a compare and contrast exercise on that question which you ruled in order. 
and uh, when they do that compare and contrast exercise, they will find a very large element of inadequacy lying at the very heart of it. At the very heart of it. And, uh, and when they do that, when they do that, of course, you will find uh, your, yourself in a situation, unfortunately, of some degree of embarrassment. This is an absolutely essential role for an opposition and for private members the ability to ask questions on matters like this. It is even more the case because the particular minister to whom it was directed has made an art form of abusing those other elements of the standing orders that you have drawn attention to from time to time and in your opening remarks, and that is the, uh, a, a wide irrelevant canvassing of his portfolio and a blow hardery of unsurpassed dimensions. And yesterday, indeed, and yesterday, indeed, this minister was up with these tenders that we are referring to. Well, this is a selection of tenders from those tenders that he is referring to, beating his chest and telling people what marvellous opportunity has been presented to them. So that other element of question time, that accountability, this is not something invented out of the air by the opposition, plucked out of the air by the opposition. Uh, it is a matter that goes heart and centre into a matter of public importance now before this nation, which this minister has been openly canvassing questions for himself on, these, on this matter and has been let off it now. Now, it's also a fact that the organisation, the, the Islamic Council, has had cause to complain about the affairs of Mr Rude. He's had this to say. They have indeed written to Deitcher and said this about it. Actions by one of our employees during the recent Deitcher tendering process may have breached the guidelines. It may also have compromised our tender for provision of employment Good services. Start, Mr Carter Rude has uh, said he'd submitted an independent tender while helping to prepare our own tender. Mr Rude had worked intimately with our own submissions for Flexi 1, Flexi 2 and Flexi 3. This matter has been raised at our last management committee meeting and Mr Rude was asked to resign. He has since done so and a copy of his resignation is attached. What we have here is a classic case of accountability, Mr Speaker, an absolutely classic case of accountability. This is an organisation in the community with a, a legitimate more quiet, concern. Please. This is an organisation with a sides. legitimate concern. This is an organisation which has made its concern public. This is an organisation dealing with the government at a, at a crucial point, a critical point, of the delivery of an important part of government services. This is an organisation which has been gazumped by one of its employees who does not have an operation but has been successful with 12 tenders. This is, if, if question time means anything at all, if question time means anything at all, then these matters ought to be capable of being subject to question in the way in which they have been subject to question by the member for Prospect in this case. If that is a question that is out of order, then there is no, then there is no capacity for question time to function effectively. You may have been somewhat worried by the length of the question. I suspect in the error that you have made that perhaps you had that in mind. And therefore, I would ask you then to have reference to the question asked by the member for Patterson and this particular question. I am sure that you will find in length that there is no difference between the two as far as length of question is concerned, and it just may have occurred to you and caused you to make this ruling in the way in which you did the fact that you were slightly embarrassed about the ruling you made on the member for Patterson for a question that was clearly out of order and, uh, and, uh, and therefore determined that the next time you got hit the next time you got hit, you would actually do something about it. Unfortunately, Mr Speaker, you have manifestly come across the wrong target, the worst conceivable target that you could have picked up. We have here an absolutely clear-cut case of accountability. I have been through all those points, and not a, a reasonable person could not have made a judgment that there are unnecessary statement of facts or reference to persons in it. There was not argument, inference, imputation, epithet, ironical expression or hypothetical matter in any part of that question at all. Not one word. Not one word. Now, I think the Leader of the House is about to get up and, uh, and defend you, as is his melancholy duty. And uh, he will no doubt say he will no doubt say during the course of it that somehow or other this whole question amounts to an argument. Well, I am afraid not. 
Argument is canvassing the issue. There was no argument in any single one of these sentences. In every single one of these sentences, it was the eliciting of information and to the point. And to the point. And only the most appallingly tendentious interpretation could be placed upon any element of it uh, to discount that. Now, Mr Speaker, I do understand that you wanted to come into this place and assert your authority on this, uh, is this your first day in office. It is an understandable thing for you to want to do. And uh, I do note that you did say, apart from asking us to stick to the standing orders as far as questions are concerned, you asked the other side to, uh, to uh, stop their enormous digressions, irrelevant abuse and all the rest of it. You didn't put it that way, but that was the implications of what you said. I am afraid to say that we would have to suspend judgment on the extent to which that part of question time has been enforced, because as far as I can see, although, though they were delivered at a lower level of decibel, the length of the answers that we have had so far, their argumentative nature, quiet, their levels of irrelevancy and all the rest of it have been pretty much up to standard practice. Pretty much up to standard practice. What has not been up to standard practice, however, has been our questions because we have sought at this Little question quiet, time please. to on phrase our side, questions yes. in such a way and on your that side they come too. within what we anticipated your sorts of rulings would be. And of all the questions we've been asked, this of all the questions has not one single jot or tittle of any offensive part, any offensive element to standing orders in it whatsoever. I am afraid to say, Mr Speaker, though you will win this particular vote as you must, because it will be a vote along party lines, it's a very, very bad start indeed. Yeah. The question is that my ruling be dissented from. I call the Honourable Minister for Workplace Relations and Sport Business. Uh, thank Leader you, of the uh, House. Mr Speaker. The government will, of course, uh, uh, oppose the dissent from your ruling uh, on the grounds that a case has not been made out. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, I was not surprised after hearing the manager of opposition business, I was not surprised that the leader of the opposition felt it necessary to himself uh, speak in this debate to try and salvage uh, the claims being made by the manager of opposition business. Mr Speaker, can I start by saying that the uh, this uh, motion uh, graphically demonstrates to the House the wisdom of its choice earlier today, and uh, in particular the two characteristics you bring to the House, Mr. Speaker. Firstly, uh, patience and tolerance, which is uh, uh, an essential ingredient in dealing with uh, those opposite, and a touch of humour thrown in for good measure. And secondly, Mr. Speaker, an extensive knowledge of the standing orders which I want to demonstrate, uh, Mr Speaker, is certainly the case uh, on this uh, occasion. I was interested in the remarks of the uh, uh, Leader of the Opposition who, who said that this uh, question did not contain any uh, argument. But I, I distinctly heard him say, and I wrote it down at the time, he said words to the effect—we can check the hands hard later—but he said that the words in the question were necessary to establish a case. Those are your own words. I mean, during, during your own presentation, you actually substantiated the argument against your own motion of dissent. It was one of the most pathetic presentations I've seen. And to have, to have the manager of opposition business you know, stand and move a dissent ruling uh, against the first ruling from the new speaker is like the novice standing and telling the expert that the expert doesn't know what they're talking about. It's like the Minister for Finance with a $23 billion deficit in his last two years telling the Treasurer how to balance the books. <laughs> I mean, it's like a, you know, it's like a— I don't remember half on a point of order. I saw you musing and I thought I'd just prompt you, but you did draw my attention on a number of occasions— After you'd repeatedly when... extended beyond the norm. So you're going to allow it There's now? No Is that a new precedent, no Mr Speaker? The Honourable Minister. Oh. 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 Uh, well, sadly, Mr. Speaker, those sort of uh, uh, smart remarks from the manager of opposition business only betray his real attitude. Mr. Speaker, in support of the uh, A ruling, bit quiet, please. Uh, in support of your uh, uh, ruling, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to refer to the standing orders, which we didn't hear much of when the uh, leader of the opposition spoke, uh, but. Uh, 
and I don't do so for your benefit, Mr. Speaker, because you clearly uh, appreciate the uh, import of them. But for instruction of uh, members of the opposition, a little bit of uh, it's uh, appropriate to refer to them. Um, the first one I want to refer to, uh, Mr. Speaker, is uh, Standing Order 147, which is alteration of question. And uh, I presume, Mr. Speaker, you had this in mind. You certainly. Uh, reflected 147 in your first remarks to the member for Prospect. Uh, 147 says, the Speaker may direct that the language of a question be changed if it seems to the Speaker unbecoming or not in conformity with the standing orders of the House. My, my memory of it is, Mr quiet, uh, Speaker, please. that in a fairly generous spirit, after your patience had been tested by the member for Prospect, reading out a question which had been drafted for her by the Hopeless Tactics Committee in the opposition. You did then invite her to uh, come back later after she'd had a chance to redraft her question. I must say, Mr Speaker, I thought that was a very generous uh, gesture on your part, and uh, that was the first thing that you did. Mr Speaker, under uh, uh, Standing Order 147, the, word, the relevant words I want to point out are uh, that you can require the, the uh, language to be changed if the words of the person asking the question are not in conformity with the standing orders. So the question, the question then is, well, in what respect was that question uh, in breach of standing orders, and uh, which standing orders therefore should we turn to? Well, Mr. Speaker, there are actually a number of standing orders which support the decision that you've made. Um, 144 is the obvious one, but it's necessary also to refer to Standing Order 153. Questions shall not be asked which reflect on or are critical of the character or conduct of those persons whose conduct may only be challenged on a substantive motion, and notice must be given of questions critical of the character or conduct of other persons. Uh, well, uh, I have the interjection. <laughs> I don't know anything he said. I mean, really, this, this is. Uh, well, I mean, the words speak for themselves. I will now read from House of Representatives practice uh, something which I direct the Leader of the Opposition to read for a first time. On page 515, it says, Questions critical of the character or conduct of other persons cannot be asked without notice. And then it goes on to say, The purpose of the rule is to protect a person against criticism which could be unwarranted. A question on notice does not receive quiet, the please. same publicity and prominence Could as I a, a little question little without. Quiet, please. I call the honourable minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the uh, the words of House of Representatives practice could not be more crystal clear. They say a question on notice does not receive the same publicity and prominence as a question without notice, and the reply can be more considered. So, so. Uh, the first thing you would say about this uh, question or series of questions is that they, they couldn't have been more clearly in breach of Standing Order 153. And in fact, the Leader of the Opposition uh, went through the various parts of the question uh, which he claimed, uh, which he claimed uh, were uh, you know, free of uh, or in conformity with the Standing Orders. Well, I'm, I'm gratefully read them out because. Uh, these are the things that this is part of the question that he read out. Um, he says uh, part of the question was what financial checks were made, and he says, "Oh, that's a totally neutral question. Totally neutral question." Well, I put it to you. I put it to you that that was a that the whole purpose of this question was to raise a the whole purpose of the question was to raise a question mark to make a criticism of a tender and the tenderer, which has been the responsibility of the minister. A, a, further, quiet, a further question which supports this uh, was that part of the, the question which, prospect. which said uh, what probity checks were made on a named individual. Now, what is that? What, is, what was the whole purpose of the question put to the Minister for Employment? The whole purpose of the question was the to make some allegations about the propriety and the uh, uh, financial sense of offering or providing uh, a contract to a named individual. The whole purpose of the question Donald was a character assassination on a, on a named individual as you wanted to secure what you believe is a few cheap political points for the Labor Party. And uh, one of the questions uh, which was read out 
in part by the Leader of the Opposition, contained the words as I wrote them down that uh, Mr R cannot deliver on the tender. Now, what is that if it is not a claim that a named person is unable to fulfil their obligations under a contract uh, presumably to be let to the Commonwealth? Uh, that, was, that was in the question. It is in breach of standing order 153. That is what he said. And Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Honourable the, Member for Brisbane. The, whole, the whole purpose of the question, as he the went Honourable on Member to expound in his defence uh, of uh, this dissent ruling, the whole, the whole basis of the question was in fact an attack on the financial probity and the character of this particular named individual. So, Mr. Speaker, on, uh, on the question of a being in breach of uh, the standing orders on 153, uh, it's, it's, it's an absolutely open and shut case. But I mean, it's even more, it's even more definitive than that. The, uh, from the Could psycho, I a little more quiet, the please, cycle, the front bench? Well, I mean, there's a lot of psycho babble coming from the other side, but this is the, Mr. Speaker, this would be the clearest case of a ruling being uh, in conformity with the standing orders that I have seen for a very long time. And in respect of uh, the, the balance of the standing orders, the opposition. I'm going to get him to keep quiet. In, in respect of standing order 144, uh, questions cannot be debated. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition Honourable made it the quite clear the that the Canberra. purpose of the question being put uh, was, in fact, to, uh, in the form of a question, uh, make an argument against the conduct of the Minister for, for Employment. Now, Mr. Uh, Speaker, on those grounds alone, uh, there is absolutely no doubt, under uh, Standing Order 153, you were entitled to. Uh, uh, in a generous spirit, suggest to the member that she go away and redraft a question. Uh, that needed to be founded on some aspects of the standing orders and based uh, on uh, the uh, question and the import and intent of the question, it was clearly in breach uh, of those uh, parts of the standing order which prevent character assassination during question time, questions without notice. They prevent, they prevent a a question which is, uh, uh, which is uh, to be debated, because standing order says questions cannot be debated. Uh, questions should not contain arguments, inferences or imputations, and it's quite clear from the statement made by the Leader of the Opposition that that was the whole purpose uh, of the question in the first place. So, Mr Speaker, uh, on any fair, reasonable analysis uh, of that question, uh, your ruling was entirely in conformity with the standing orders, entirely in conformity with the House of Reps practice. It couldn't be clearer. And you can only conclude, therefore, that the tactics committee, someone, the leader probably said to Simon Crean, oh well we got a got a new speaker, so Simon, you know, as soon as you get a chance, whip in a uh, a motion of dissent. And the only thing you didn't tell Simon is make sure if you've got a motion of dissent, you've actually got some basis. Make sure, make sure, Simon, that you actually have a case that you can mount. And uh, uh, the, the fact that the Leader of the Opposition, after hearing the most pathetic performance—in fact, I would say a juvenile performance by the Manager of Opposition Business—after hearing that, he clearly felt sufficiently embarrassed that he himself had to, to uh, rise and to try and defend and salvage uh, the uh, dissent ruling that they put. Mr. Uh, Speaker, I don't think we should waste the, house, uh, the, the, yeah, the, yeah. the time of the House anymore. Uh, this is an absolutely open and shut case, and I move that the question be put. The question is that the question be now put. Those in favour, please say aye. Those against, no. Is the division required? Division required. I call the, the clerks to ring the bells.
I'd feel a lot happier if I were able to defend myself, but I can't in these circumstances. The eyes will move to the right of the chair. Uh, lock the doors. I bet that'd be a good idea. <laughs> lock the doors. The eyes will move to the right of the chair. The nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite, Fish and Riverina. Tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Bruce Fowler and Maribyrnong. Tell us for the nose. Oh, you did, right. I keep about forgetting about locking the doors and things like that.
segment. The result of the division is ayes 87, noes 46. I declare the motion carried. I therefore put the question that the ruling I gave, that the question by the Honourable Member for Prospect was out of order, be agreed to. Be agreed to. Those in favour of the question, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. Aye. Is the division acquired? Division being acquired, ring the bells for one minute, it being a successive division. I ask members to take note of those provisions. I ask uh, all members, please, to take their places as quickly as possible. Eyes will move to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I point the honourable members for Angamite, Fish and Riverina. Tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong. Tell us for the nose.
The result of the division is noes 87, ayes 46. I'm pleased to be able to tell you that the motion of dissent is lost. I ask members to return to their place as uh, quickly and as soon as possible. I'll give you that. I ask members to return to their places as quickly as possible, please. I call the honourable member for Aston.